Good morning. It is great to be with you. Uh, I, has, I spent the whole morning kind of looking around and seeing faces and thinking, ah, oh, I love you. Um, we were, I mean, Helen and I were part of Grace Church, part of the leadership team here for, well, we're part of Grace Church for about 15 years. We've been uh, in Birmingham for about four, so it's always wonderful to come back. Um, this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 15. If you've got a Bible, it might help you to turn there. And I am going to be talking about a much underrated Christian virtue, friendship. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. The pandemic and lockdown changed everything in, in probably every way you can imagine. Our society is still recovering in lots of ways. It, it's also true that we as individuals are still recovering, whether you feel like that or not. I wonder if you've noticed that in the last year or two, all of your relationships with other people are harder than they used to be. I suspect lots of people, you might not go, well, not all of them, but I suspect lots of people can relate to that, that relationships just seem more difficult than they used to be. It, the lockdown particularly damaged our friendships. There's lots of data that says that everything but the very closest friendships that people had slipped away. Like our, our wider networks disappeared. But honestly, things were broken before that. Back in 2018, the US Surgeon General, and I think this will probably be true for the UK as well, announced an epidemic of loneliness as a medical issue, particularly affecting middle-aged men, but affecting everyone to some extent. And you can wind your way back a lot further. 60 years ago, in his book, The Four Loves, the writer C.S. Lewis was bemoaning the lack of friendship, particularly among middle-aged men. <laughs> And you can, and he was even saying then, it's like, oh, this has been true for a couple of hundred years. The pandemic might have destroyed our wider friendships, and close ones kind of managed to carry on, but close friendships have been dwindling for centuries, actually. And yet, to live the Christian life, I would firmly contend that you need deep friendships. And the older you get, almost the more impossible they feel. Uh, someone once quipped that the greatest miracle in the Bible was a guy in his late 30s having 12 close friends. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as a guy in his late 30s, I can relate. Um, right, I'm going to read to you from John chapter 15, and we can see something that Jesus has to say about this. I'm going to be starting in verse 12. This is Jesus talking. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and your fruit would abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. No longer do I call you slaves, but I have called you friends. I mean... I don't know how earth shattering that sounds to you. I suspect in some ways it sounds kind of normal. I think we've devalued the word friend to the point that that is not utterly surprising. You, you could imagine the setting where maybe at the end of this meeting, um, you go, you get your coffee, the kids have come out of kids' work. There's a little kid who you sort of know, and they totter up to you, and they're holding um, something that they've made in children's work, their craft, and you can't quite identify what it is, and you're sort of trying to figure out what they might be about to tell you, and you think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and engage, and you say, well, what did you learn about today? And they look at you, and they say, Jesus is my friend, and you go, oh, yeah, very nice, thank you, great. And you think, that's okay, sure, it's a bit trite. <laughs> I'm sure there are deeper things we could learn in church. Are there? <laughs> Are there deeper things we could learn in church? Jesus is my friend. He says, no longer do I call you slaves, but I call you friends. So he has the implication, I have every right to call you slaves, which he does. He is the Lord God Almighty, our master. He 
you could go, I mean, that's, that sounds very offensive on our ears, and I'm kind of going to move over that. But, so forgive me, but it, it, the Bible would say he has every right to call us that. He could say, yes, you're slaves, and I'm your master. He says, no longer do I call you that, though. And you think, okay, wow, this sounds great. What's he going to say next? Put aside the fact that I've read it to you and you know what's coming, but what would you imagine he's going to say next? Not slave and therefore master, but what? Well, we might think, okay, not slave and master, but maybe like follower and leader. That would feel softer, wouldn't it? Like, oh, yeah, he's our leader, we're his followers. I like that. Or maybe even like disciple and teacher. Okay, yeah, like, again, I could kind of work with that. Disciple means learner. So someone like learning from Jesus, I could kind of work with that. But he doesn't do that. Not slave and master, not follower and leader, not disciple and teacher. All of these are true, though. But friend, what is the counterpart to friend? Friend. Jesus is radically leveling our relationship when he says, no longer do I call you slaves, though that could be true. He says, but I choose to call you friend. He, the one with power, is saying, I am leveling your relationship. I'm calling you something where the, the, the term that you then call me is the same one I call you. It's, it's like radically equal, which should confuse us or greatly surprise us. God is speaking to us as equals when he says, I choose to call you friends. I choose to call you friends. And we can't make ourselves equal with God, but he, the greater one, can say, I choose to make us equal. God is our friend. (laughs) What? I mean, that should. Again, I still think on the ear it probably sounds kind of trite. We call a lot of people friends. But that should induce something of awe. Let's just think for a moment about who this God is that we're talking about, who Jesus is. So we're talking about the God who speaks And then things are created. In fact, you've never seen anything in the world which was not, doesn't exist because God spoke it into being. He is the one whose word creates. Look around the room. Every person you can see exists because God spoke them into being, as does the carpet and the walls and the ceiling and this lectern and this drum screen. I'm going to stop pointing at stuff. But everything you can see exists because God spoke it into being. There is nothing that he did not speak. He is, the theologians would call him, the unmoved mover, or the uncaused cause. The one everything in the world is moved by something else except him. He's the very ground of being. He is existence. Everything finds its source in him. Paul, in the book of Acts, says that we, in him, we live and move and have our being. He is the source of life. He's the one who the book of Hebrews calls the consuming fire, who in Isaiah's vision of heaven, he says that angels who have never sinned and are perfect in every way have to hide their faces from him because of his holiness. They cannot look at him because of his holiness. He says, I'd like to be your friend. The one who, when he appeared in fire before Moses said, my name is I am, that tells you everything you need to know about me who at the point he said he'd reveal himself to Moses in Exodus 34, just after that event in the tabernacle that Chris was referring to, he said, you can look at my back as I walk past. And as, him, and as you do, I'm going to tell you what my name is. And he declares himself to be Yahweh, Yahweh, gracious, and merciful, and abounding in love, slow to anger, and he will forgive those who ask. That God, that almighty, wonderful, surprising God, who should induce in us at least a little bit of trepidation about approaching, he comes to us and he says, no longer do I call you slaves, but I call you friends. (laughs) Friends. And it sounds impossible. I would totally understand if you're here, you're following Jesus. I mean, if you're here, you're looking in, this is an invitation for you. If you'd like, you can be his friend. If you're here, you're following Jesus, I'd understand if there were people who doubt that that is true for them, who for various reasons would think, I don't know if that's how God feels about me. For all I kind of get that, like in a general way, maybe. 
What does Jesus say? He says, you're my friend if you do what I command you, which can sound harsh on the ear, but I think you should hear it the other way around. When you doubt and you wonder, is Jesus my friend? Ask yourself this. Are you trying to follow him? Are you doing the things that he asks of you? I suspect your answer would be, well, Tim, kind of. Kind of, if I'm honest, but like I'm having a go, at which I think the Lord would turn to you and say, great, that means you're my friend. That means you can say that the consuming fire, Yahweh himself, is your friend and would say to you, no longer do I call you a slave, you're my friend. Wow. Just sit with that thought for a minute. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Wow. God wants to be your friend. It sounds childish, almost. It sounds trite. And yet, could there be anything bigger? He wants to be your friend. And that is where we start in thinking about friendship with one another. That God wants to be our friend. So what do we mean by friendship? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a slippery word, if we're honest. We kind of use it to talk about everything from the people that you're connected to on Facebook to the person that you talk to every day and think maybe you take a bullet for. We, they're your friends. And yet, clearly, those relationships are quite different, and there's quite a lot of different options in between that spectrum. What are we talking about? Well, I mean, part of the problem is we don't have words for all these different things. But think of it from the life of Jesus. Jesus was often surrounded by great crowds who he was definitely friendly towards most of the time. And he would probably have felt happy going, yeah, I could call you friend. And then he was also surrounded by a group called the 72, his disciples, who I'm sure he had closer, much closer relationships with, and the kind of crowds he was gathered around, the people he sort of knew a bit and followed him. The 72, he'd know them much better. And then he had the 12, the 12 disciples, his, his close friends. And then he had the three, Peter, James, and John, his closer friends. And then he had John, his best friend, the one who could call himself the, the disciple who Jesus loved. All of them, we could probably use the word friend for, would mean something slightly different. There were kind of these layers of friendship. Sociologists call them uh, strong, weak, and middle ties. That's the wrong order, but you know what I mean? Strong, middle, and weak ties. We kind of have different layers of friendship. You could see that in your own life. Think of different people. You'll have, you may or may not have any very close friends, but you'll have people at different levels. There'll be the, the guy that you see on the train every morning who you've never spoken to, probably wouldn't call me friend, but that's like the weakest level of connection all the way through to the people that you know really well. The thing is, we, we need all of those. To live, an, like a, to live a human life, to flourish, you need all of those different kinds of connection. The pandemic damaged those wider ones, and we don't yet seem to be recovering them. And we've been losing the closer, deeper friendships, for, like I said, for centuries. It's not good for us. There's I, I, it's something like you have 30% increased morbidity if you are lonely, which I, I doctor would have to tell me exactly what that means. It sounds like you're 30% more likely to die, which can't be true. We're all going to die. But presumably, in a medical circumstance, that can't be what it actually means. Presumably, in a medical circumstance, actually, your outcomes are less good if you're lonely, if you lack relationships, if you lack friendships. We need friends. I think it is almost impossible to live the Christian life, to follow Jesus without a web of friendships at different levels. You might, yeah, I don't know, that might sound surprising to you. I mean, you need, you might think, oh, I don't know if I need friends, but I, 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 I kind of just need Jesus, don't I? Well, that isn't what Jesus told us to do. He told us to be in a church with a web of relationships that we're supposed to gather together to worship, to witness someone going through the waters of death into new life, like we just did, to eat his body and blood at a table, to, to hear the word preached, to worship together. That collection of events is, is how we follow Jesus together. But more than that, we definitely need friends because Jesus didn't try and live his life on his own either. And yet I'm surprised by the number of us, and by this I'm actually aiming at myself, um, who, who try to, who try to live the Christian life without friends. If Jesus didn't, why would we? And yet we try it. Especially, I think this is probably true for everyone, but especially men in our culture struggle with friendship, and especially men from middle age onwards struggle 
this friendship. That's not, and that's not his fault. That's a cultural thing. It's probably not the same in every culture around the world. But we do. So Jesus didn't try and live Christian life without friendships. So why, why do we, if we're honest, because friendships are hard. I don't know if you've noticed that, but they're, they're not easy. Require something of you and of the other person, kind of to meet each other halfway. Jesus had at least 12 of them. <laughs> I, am, I could count my deep friendships on one hand, and I wouldn't need all the fingers. Um, but we need them. We need deep friendships. C.S. Lewis, in that book I referenced, The Four Loves, described friendship as the least natural of loves. It doesn't come naturally to us. We don't find it straightforward. There's something about the human condition that makes it difficult for us. And he also said, it's the way the angels feel about each other, which will sound again odd on our ear. It's the least natural of loves because it's the most spiritual. It's the one that most endures into the age to come. Friendship. Because it's the web of relationships in the church where it's supposed to be. It endures. Friendship. Um, the Bible talks about friendship a lot, though often not using that word. One of the best examples of a close, deep friendship, particularly between two men in history, is we find it in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, uh, sorry, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26 says, if you just pop it on the screen, that'd be great. Um, it says, this is David talking. He's actually talking after Jonathan has died, his best friend. He says, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than the love of women. Sounds weird to us. There's lots of reasons why it sounds a bit weird to us. <laughs> but that's their friendship. We, we find it difficult almost not to read this sexually because of various things in our culture. But it's not what they're talking about. It's friendship. Your love to me was more wonderful than the love of women, or presumably if they were two women, your love to me is more wonderful than the love of men. The, so close friends that they're like, I love you the best. Wow. When I talk about deep friendship, I'm talking about aiming in that direction. We might, we might get there, but certainly aiming in that direction. I have probably two friends on that kind of level and some other friends where that's deepening. I wouldn't actually say this about any of them because it seems odd, but we're moving in that direction maybe. I, I wouldn't want to claim to be an expert. We're talking about the kind of friendship that Jesus had with James and with Peter and with John. So to tell you about one of them, my friend Phil, we've been friends for about 18 years. We met actually at Grace Church um, as first year students, um, which wasn't in this building at the time, it was in Notts County football grounds. And we have been friends on and off, not to the same level, but for about 18 years. We taught most days. Uh, he, this morning on the way here, he dropped me a message to say, oh, it goes well today. And then he sent me a series of gifts trying to find the most awkward friendship gift. Or I think it was, no, most horrifying was what he said, friendship gift that he could, which was super encouraging. Um, <laughs> we, what have I learned about friendship through Phil and through others as well? well it, first thing, it's forged in suffering. Friendship is forged in suffering. And honestly, everything worth having is don't if you twig that about the Christian life. Jesus says we'll be broken like bread. Everything worth having is forged in suffering. For us, that has either been, uh, think of different friendships, either one of us has gone through an incredibly hard time, the other one's walked it through with them, or we've gone through something together that has made us friends. So, I mean, top tip, you want some friends, suffer. <laughs> You'll help in lots of ways, actually. You'll get close to Jesus, too. Um, See, that's really trite. I'll say some more about that in a minute. The uh, other things, we have things in common. To be good friends with me, you do need to have something to talk about. We have things in common, but particularly ways of looking at the world. But I mean, a lot of what we talk about, we talk about our lives and stuff that's happening that's difficult. We talk about music. We talk about novels that we like. Phil is currently reading a novel that we both enjoyed for the second time, and he is essentially live texting it to, to me as we go with his kind of reactions and theories. Every day I get a little bit of he's like, come up with some other madcap theory about what might be going on. We, and we're interested in the things that they're interested in. My friend Phil is interested in, I always have to read this out, he's interested in neuroplasticity, which I can never get the word right if he doesn't tell me what it is. Uh, it's to do with kind of psychology and brain science and how those two things introduce, uh, kind of influence each other. I couldn't give two hoots, but I'm 
interested when he tells me about it because I love him. It works. I've noticed other friends doing it to us. My wife, Helen, is big into the sport of curling. So we watch quite a lot of curling in our house, which is often hard to find. We watch it on like Russian commentary on YouTube or something. But the, <laughs> during the Winter Olympics, it's fairly easy to find. Friends who are our close friends start, got into it because we like it. It's almost, I think, so that they could text us about it or talk to us about it or pop around and say, oh, I was watching the curling and a thing happened. I didn't know what was going on. But, you know, they're interested in it. Fourth thing, common to deep friendships. We tell the truth, unvarnished. A poet once called friendship the hopeful fear in the sense that what you do when you're friends is you make yourself vulnerable in that you kind of give someone else a weapon that they could hurt you with by telling them about your heart. And what you're hoping they're going to do is not hurt you, but almost if you like turn around and defend you with it. But there's, there's a fear to it because you're like, I don't know, I'm making myself vulnerable. You could now hurt me. I'm kind of hoping and trusting that you won't, Sometimes that doesn't happen. That's what deep friendships are like on at least a superficial level. I think that sounds a bit like me and Jesus. Do you spot that? Forged in suffering. Now, <laughs> might be a bit. That Jesus died on the cross for me. Yes, his suffering rescued me and is the foundation of my friendship with him. But more, not well, not more than that, but beyond that, my friendship with Jesus, who is honestly my best mate, it develops when I go through hard times. My suffering is one of the things that helps me go, oh my word, I need him. And we talk more. And we become better friends and we become closer through my suffering. We have things in common. Yes, we have common ways of looking at the world because I have chosen to submit myself to his way of looking at the world, but it's still true. We're interested in what they're interested in. Well, that's true, isn't it? There's lots of things in the Christian life that if you ask me cold, I'd be like, I have very little interest in doing that. But the Lord says I should. <laughs> and yet, but it's our friendship that changes it from duty, I'll do what I'm told, to I want to do what he wants. And we tell the truth unvarnished. I mean, there is no one who tells you the truth about yourself like Jesus. He is kind enough normally to tell you only one thing at once. Um, but I also do tell him the truth about how I'm feeling, about what's actually going on, because he knows it anyway. But as I do so, I find that our friendship deepens. We need friends. We need friends like Jesus is our friend, but we need them in other people. Actually, you learn how to be friends with Jesus by having friends who also love him. We need friends. How do you do that? How do you get friends? <laughs> I mean, it's a perennial question, isn't it? How do you get friends? I have once sat across the table from someone and said, would you be my friend? Which I wasn't five. <laughs> I, was, I was in my mid-20s, I think, maybe older, actually. Um, it worked, but <laughs> you don't have to do that necessarily. How do you get friends? I think to simplify it massively, two things you can do, and I'm going to, be, going to give you an action to take away. So two things you can do. Number one, take the initiative where you can anyway. Take the initiative. Be, be someone who takes a step towards someone else. So that might mean in terms of being hospitable, which in our ears will sound like having people to your home and cooking them food maybe, which is not a bad thing. I am big on getting everyone around your table and putting some food in front of them. Great, friendships can be formed that way. But think of hospitality broader as inviting someone else to do something. Take the initiative in terms of saying to a friend or someone you might like to be your friend or a friend that you'd like to deepen, would you like to go and do this thing? Either something that you enjoy or something that you know they enjoy and you don't mind. <laughs> Inviting others to do things or take the initiative in terms of being vulnerable. Because friendship is, is both things. It's doing activities together that you kind of enjoy. And it's then the vulnerability that opens up Christian friendship. Be vulnerable. Tell them something about how you're doing. Tell them what you're scared of at the moment. Tell them about your sin. Tell them about a thing that's really worrying you. Tell them about stuff, dif difficult decisions you're trying to make. Tell them about where you're angry or hurt. And the way vulnerability tends to work is that one person takes the initiative and goes a little bit more vulnerable than you've been before. And then the other person goes, oh gosh, okay, I'm going to be brave and do that too. And then at some later point, one of you, it doesn't always have to be the same person, 
then goes, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit more vulnerable than I have been before. And the other person thinks, flip. <laughs> okay, here we go. And they're a little bit vulnerable again. So like, one of you always has to go first. Otherwise, the two of you will sit there looking at each other, waiting for someone to open your heart, and just kind of hoping that you read each other's pain. This it doesn't work. You've got to take the initiative where you can. And the second way, the second thing we can do to make friends, show up. Take the initiative and show up, by which I mean make time. Friendships take a very long time to develop. Really deep friendships take decades, probably, or incredibly intense suffering. <laughs> it takes a long time. That's OK. We're not trying to get anywhere overnight. The Christian life is never like that. It's always a slow walk forwards. But show up, make time. It takes a long time. Essentially, what I'm saying is you can't shortcut it. You kind of need to keep going, yeah, I'm going to show up. Yeah, I, I, our friendship is developing. I'd love it was over here, but it's not. I'm going to show up a little bit more. I'm going to show up a little bit more. Which doesn't mean that you have to keep persisting in a relationship which is, is not turning into a friendship. But it does mean that if you see someone wants to do a thing that you think they might enjoy, and it's a bit awkward, you could probably try it again <laughs> before you can it in. And again, at the risk of being slightly superficial, those two steps are what Jesus has done for you. He took the initiative. I mean, in a bigger way than you're going to. He didn't say, do you want to go for a beer? He said, I am going to come from the heavens to earth and grip your life and rescue you and rend you and pull you all the way into the love of the Father. But he took the initiative. He's the one who did it first. And then it is in response that we go, yeah, I love you. And he shows up. By which I mean, if Jesus was not patient, none of us would be here. I, he loves us enough that he's willing to be patient with the fact that we're a mess, and we're full of sin, and we have to keep repenting, and we learn a little bit at a time, we become a little bit more like him step by step by step. Basically, what you do for other people is what Jesus has done for you, to some extent. So the action I'd like to suggest you take going forward, maybe over the next month or so, think about this. Who would you like to be better friends with? Invite them to do something this month. And then while you're there, if you can, go ever so slightly deeper in terms of how vulnerable you are with them than you have before. And if you're in the room and you get an invite to do something from someone that you know a bit, and your feeling is like, I don't know if I want to, how about you go? Even if it sounds like hard work, try it. Try it. They, they might just be trying to reach out. You never know what will happen. I mean, it doesn't, not everyone has to click with everyone else. That's okay. But why don't you try it? Because that is what Jesus has done for us. A willingness to be with someone who, on the face of it, I mean, calling us awkward would be mild. We hated him and were riddled with sin. He chose to come to us anyway and rescue us. Extend a little bit of grace to you, to others in the church, when they reach out for friendship. Okay, if the band could come. We are going to sing to Jesus who has made himself our friend. And while we do, what we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to do is start to drop into your minds maybe who you could reach out to. Who could you go make friends with?